electronic device here set up, ready to go. I want to just begin um, and remind us of what we've, we've been learning. Amen? Last week, we had, well, actually two weeks ago, we, three weeks ago, we started on the Holy Spirit. And we've, we had uh, a lot of scriptures that showed us about who he was and who he wanted to be in our lives. And then um, last week, Bishop Andrew was here, and he shared some really interesting insights out of the Old Testament about the purpose of the church, the shadow of the church in Genesis chapter 28. And that was an amazing thing. It, was, it, it wasn't any completely new information. I knew all of those things, but to see the shadow of what the purpose of the church was in the Old Testament was really wonderful for me. It changed my mindset. So this Sunday, we're going to discuss the language of heaven. Now, I'm not talking to any strangers here about the Holy Spirit, about the language of heaven. But I want to just kind of give some insight and maybe some changing or tweaking of, a, of how we look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the prayer languages that we, the prayer language that we receive. So one of the greatest tragedies in the last 100 years of church history has been that the enemy, the devil, has done everything that he could to successfully, and I mean successfully, divert the church away from the Holy Spirit. Right? I know because we belonged to a church that wanted to completely avoid the Holy Spirit and the subject of the Holy Spirit. So I want to go over some historical information that might be helpful for you to know. You may already know it. If you do, help me if I miss something, okay? Back in 1904, and that's a really long time ago, longer, longer than I've ever been here, uh, a great revival began, okay? And it was in the nation of Wales. And this revival became known as the Welsh Revival. In this revival, lukewarm Christians, we don't have any of those around here now in these days, do we? Lukewarm Christians became on fire. Churches filled up. Bars and houses of prostitution closed their doors for lack of business. And more importantly, over 100,000 people gave their lives to Christ. Now this all began because some dedicated people began to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So that same spirit of revival hopped over the Atlantic and came here to America. And that type of revival, the spirit of that revival, broke out in different places in America. Now, one of the places this Pentecostal controversy started was on Bonnie Bray Avenue near downtown L.A. And there, a group of prayer warriors were praying for God to move in America just as he had in the Welsh Revival. Well, as you know, God hears us when we pray, right? He hears us children when we pray. And soon, people of prayer began to experience the book of Acts. All of the things that we read about and that we see began to happen on Bonnie Bray Street or Bonnie Bay Avenue, in LA, and I tell you the names because if you ever go there, these are real places. This really happened. It happened in a house on Bonnie Bray Avenue. Well, soon it began so got became so large that they had to move to another location, and they bought a building, and that building was on Azusa Street, and this revival became known as the Azusa Street Revival. Many people were touched. 
Many, many people from all over the country went to Azusa Street to experience this revival that was taking place, to be in the presence of God and to have Holy Spirit touch them and be on them. Well, just like us men and women, we began to, um, you know, get involved and, and try to explain what was happening. So they were speaking in tongues and they started to examine what was going on. How are we going to explain this thing? And they said that indeed the initial experience of many people in the New Testament when filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues happened. Well, then the spirit of debate, the enemy got in there. And they started going back and forth and they decided to change some of the wording. And they started changing the experience to evidence. So the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was speaking in tongues, and then they changed it even more, and they wanted to say, they added the physical. So the initial physical evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was speaking in tongues. Now, we do believe that, but I want us to examine this phrase, the initial evidence of speaking in tongues the baptism of the Holy Spirit, those things, things. So, I'm not sure if I like the word evidence. This is why. Because if you're looking for evidence, that puts it in somebody else's hands to say whether or not you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, we don't know for sure, when you look at the Bible, we don't know for sure that everyone received the prayer language or began speaking in tongues when they were baptized. We don't know that for sure. Many instances in the New Testament tell us that that's what happened. It talked about they were baptized, the Holy Spirit came, and they began speaking in tongues. Okay? Here's another thing. The Bible never talks about or never explicitly says that speaking in tongues was the evidence. That was man's attempt to explain what God was doing, what Holy Spirit was doing. So this phrase, this phraseology, now becomes a demand. This is a demand on us. If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're going to speak in other tongues immediately, rather than a desire. And I'm not so certain that all of that emphasis was what the Holy Spirit wanted. All of a sudden, the evidence we're looking for takes us away from the person and the power of Holy Spirit and puts it all on the gift. Totally took us away from, from who Holy Spirit is. And if you remember this series, The God I Never Knew, when I spoke on the second, the second of the third series, was that we want to know who Holy Spirit is, the person, because he's a person, and not just this thing that floats around. So when we're focusing all on this gift, we're moving away from the person of Holy Spirit. So even in the middle now, and I want to bring this back around, even in the middle of all of this controversy going back and forth, I want to say this. We must not forget that uh, there is a prayer language. There's a prayer language that we receive when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's scriptural, and it's designed to build us up, to encourage us. Okay? We become bold in our faith. We become bold in our witness because of the baptism, the person of the Holy Spirit being a part of our lives. Amen? So there's three things that we want to look at this morning about the language of heaven. First, it's scriptural. Now I'm sure that all of you could probably give me one or two scriptures, what you know about, where the, it shows that the Holy Spirit and the baptism is in the, in the verses of the Bible. So we're going to be looking at the first one is 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and that's where we're going to spend most of our time today. 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, and I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard. And it says this. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. I'll read that again. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. So in this one verse, we see two things. We, it says, does not speak to men, but to God. So you're speaking to God when you're praying in tongues. And in his spirit, it's not in the natural, not in your mind, but in the spirit. When we're speaking to God, and it's our spirit, or with the spirit, that we're praying or we're speaking. Now, I want to ask this question. What's a common term for speaking to God? That's it. Exactly. Is that what you had, Jenna, praying? Yes. We're praying to God. We're speaking to God. Pretty simple, right? Speaking to God is simply prayer. Go figure. And anyone who speaks to God is praying. That's elementary. That's just the most simplest thing. And Paul, here in 1 Corinthians, is trying to make a distinction between the speaking in tongues, the grace, the prayer language that we receive, and the gift of tongues. Okay, so in, in the Corinthian church, if you remember, they were having a lot of issues going back and forth. There was probably some really crazy things going on, and Paul's trying to put everything in order. So if we continue to read, verses 14 and through 16 say this. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray in the spirit, and I will pray with my mind also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say amen to your giving of thanks? Since he does not know what you're saying. Some um, translations will say in um, my understanding. Right? So really, basically, he's trying to lay out here that there is a difference between speaking. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit's praying. That's exactly what he's saying. But my mind is unfruitful. And how many have experienced that? I've prayed in the spirit, right? And my mind doesn't necessarily know what, I'm, what my spirit is speaking, but I know something's going on. Something's going on in the spirit. So Paul, again, he's laying this out here that, that there is a distinction. But also what this is doing, again, is it's telling us that it's scriptural. Straight up. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit's praying. Okay? Secondly, point number two, if you're taking notes, the language of heaven is a benefit. It's a benefit. Edifying yourself and the church. Okay? Verse 4 of 14, 1 Corinthians 4, 14, says this. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Plain and simple, no question, right? Some might say, oh, but that's selfish if you're doing that just for yourself. No, it's not. Right. It's scriptural. It's scriptural. Edifying yourself in the church. So in verse 14, that word edify means to build up, to strengthen, or improve. I think I need some improving every once in a while. Okay? So that word is important to us. If we pray in the Spirit, we strengthen ourselves. 
We need some strengthening. We need some uplifting. And Paul continues that here. He says, now, I wish that you all, and this proves that he was from the South, y'all. I wish that y'all spoke in more, in, okay, so I'm going to go back. I'll, I'll do this right. <laughs> now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but, and I want you to circle this but because we're going to come back to it. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may receive edifying. So we see a couple things here. Okay, we again see the speaking in our prayer language, but we also see the gift of tongues because it talks about interpreting so that the church would be edified. So again, laying the foundation that if we're speaking in tongues in our prayer language, that's for us, that's to edify us. But the church is edified by the gift of tongues when there's interpretation with it, okay? And I want you to remember this, that when you're praying in your spirit, you're speaking to God. But if you're prophesying or speaking in the gift of tongues with interpretation, that's God to us. And that's why that's the edification for the church, because that carries a message directly from God to his people, to his children. All right? Now, the word but, I told you we were going to go back to that, and I want you to circle it. This word in the Greek New Testament is the two letters, D-E, or day or dead, okay? And it, it means but, it's translated and, and in some places the phrase, in other words, okay? Throughout the New Testament, that same word appears. And it is indeed translated but, and, and the phrase, in other words. So, if we were to put the word and in this verse instead of but, it would explain everything. Paul is saying, now I wish that you all spoke in tongues and even more that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may receive edification. If you read it the way that it's set out, you might think that Paul is saying, do this, prophesy. Not this, speaking in tongues. If you just look at that but. You've got to remember that in this Greek, it's a, con it's a conjunction. It's not either or. Okay? So that's really what he's saying. Pray in tongues and, and prophesy. Desire to prophesy. Okay? Now, let's turn to Ephesians. We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 6. Now, we're talking about the fact that the language of heaven, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, is a benefit to us. We learned that it's scriptural. We're looking at it. It's right here, plain as day. We're going to also support that in Ephesians chapter 6. But it's also a benefit to us. Now, in Ephesians chapter 6, twice it tells us, Paul tells us, twice he tells us to put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. Okay, and we're going to read along. We're going to see that praying in the Spirit is part of the whole armor of God. So Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, read this way. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against what? The schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up, here it is again, the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist the devil in the evil day. And having done everything, stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having, your, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation.
preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all that he just got done telling us, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, which with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. Underline, circle, exclamation point. With, and with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So Paul is clearly telling us that part of that armor that we need to stand, to fight the enemy, is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So it's a benefit to us. It strengthens us. It encourages us. And one more scripture, if you didn't need it, another one. Jude, verse 20. Right there. What's it say? Build yourself up. Plain simple. In the Holy Spirit. So when I was trying to think of examples, I thought about cooking, because I like to cook, right? And part of the thing, if you wanted to look at it, you need to add salt when you cook. There's just no way around it. If you're going to boil and make pasta, if you don't put salt in that water, I do not want to eat those pasta noodles, right? They're kind of bland. There's nothing to it. How many of you have eaten a meal and there just not be enough salt in it? When you add the salt, it adds, brings up the flavor, right? It just wakens it up. It's kind of like even if you squeeze lime on a Mexican dish or lemon on fish. It just brightens the flavor. The Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is like that to our lives. And if you think about it, even said we're supposed to be salt and light. I don't know. So the other thing that I want to say, Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. Now, remembering that we talked about who the person of the Holy Spirit is as a person. Remember I mentioned that he has a lot. He has, do we measure his IQ? But you can't measure IQ because that's a formula, right, to measure intelligence. And he's got all the eyes. We don't need to measure it because he's all-knowing. He's God, like God the Father. And the attributes are that he's all-knowing. In... Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, it reads, In the same way, the Spirit, capital S, also helps our weaknesses. Again, lending to the idea that we're going to be strengthened. Helps our weaknesses. For we do not know how to pray as we should. In my understanding, in my mind, I may not know how to pray, but, I like that but, I circle it, the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he, capital H, who searches the hearts, our hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints, and get this, according to the will of God. So when we're praying, and we may not know exactly what to pray for, our spirit knows what to pray for. And the Holy Spirit intercedes through us and gets a whole lot more done sometimes. So just as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, what, what then do we say? I will pray in the spirit, and I will pray in my understanding because it's beneficial for me because the spirit knows the will of God. And somewhere else in the New Testament it says if you pray according to his will, he's going to answer you. I don't know. Maybe that's a good idea too. Okay. Lastly, number three. 
So number one, we talked about the fact that, it, that the language of heaven is scriptural. Number two, it's a benefit for us. And number three, it's a choice. Now, remembering what it was like when we were first seeking the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the South, very different atmosphere than here. Maybe not so much. I guess people everywhere kind of think this. Oh my gosh, if I yield to the Holy Spirit and get the baptism, I'm just going to gush out this prayer language and what are people going to think? Or maybe when I'm standing there on the checkout counter or pumping gas, I might start speaking in Swahili. I mean, come on, really? You know, because of the two different things, right? The prayer language or not at all. Okay? God is not like that. Because if you look, Paul says in, in chapter 14 here, he says, if I pray, if I pray, Pray in the Spirit. It's a choice. We are controlled. In the New Testament, it also says that the Spirit is subject to the prophet. Meaning, your spirit is subject to you. Okay? You don't need to worry about it. Don't, it you're, it's not, the, the Holy Spirit is not going to do that. And when we first started seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but people told us, watch out. That's of the devil. That's of the devil, and you're going to get a, a demon. I don't, like I said, you know, we're in the South, Pentecost. We went to Baptist churches. We went to Pentecostal churches. We went to Baptist churches. We were like, you know, you're in the Bible Belt. You hear a lot of different things. But I want, to, I want us to examine this. I had to ask myself, am I going to really sincerely believe that if I'm asking God for something that he's going to give me a demon or he's going to allow an evil spirit to come upon me? No, I don't think so. We're going to look at some scriptures, okay? In Luke chapter 10, so these next two that we're going to look at is going to be in the, chap in the book of Luke. So Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Now, God in his wisdom, remembering that he is all-knowing, knew that the devil, the enemy of the church, the enemy of our soul, was going to try to stir some things up. Amen? He knew the, he knew the devil. He knew what he was going to do. So he made a provision. And in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, this is after the 70 had gone out and they had done mighty works. And they came back rejoicing that even the demons were subject to us. If you remember, you read a little bit back there. But in 19 he says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will injure you. Jesus said that to them, and he says that to us. Remember that he has given us authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Now that's just not meaning in the physical snakes and the scorpions that they had. That's actually, you can refer that back to the devil and his demons, the evil spirits. He's given us authority over them and nothing is going to harm us. Amen. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Next one. Come on. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, 11 through 13. It's a choice, but we need to ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit. So according to Jesus here, he says this. He's talking to them. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he's asking for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So, 
We don't have to worry about the fact that some evil spirit may come upon us. God's not going to allow that to happen. Our Father clearly has told us He's going to give us the Holy Spirit if we ask. So we must choose that gift. We must choose to ask. We must make the choice. We're in, in control. We can choose to pray or not to pray in the Spirit. We can choose to receive the benefit that God has planned for us. And it's plainly said in Scripture. So I want to give everybody the opportunity. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Now I know some of you here have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I want to give you the opportunity. And I want to completely get away from the idea, the demand of speaking in tongues. Because that's going to happen. That's just going to come. Maybe some of you here today need, I'm going to say a refilling, a fresh anointing, a fresh pouring out of His Spirit on us. Maybe there's some of you here that don't even have, have never asked, have never really thought about really asking for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, knowing Father God and knowing Holy Spirit, He has been speaking to you this morning. The altars are open. I want you to come up, whatever it is. And then lastly, you may have a prayer need completely outside of what we spoke about this morning. When we come to church, when there's two or three gathered in His name, He is here. Holy Spirit is here. And Father God wants to meet your need. So let's come. Let's stand up. And let's come and see God. So that we kind of leak as Christians. Amen? We, 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 we walk with God, we walk with God, and all of a sudden then we start getting ourselves walking away from the Lord. We're not listening to the Holy Spirit as He guides us through our lives. So why don't we just leave your seats for just a few moments, come to the altar, ask Father God, that fill you again with His Spirit so you're aware of His presence in your life every day. Ask Him to forgive you if you need forgiveness. But the Holy Spirit wants to fill you to overflowing so rivers of living water will flow out to you, the water that gives life to the dying world. Amen? Come, come on. Don't be afraid. Let's everybody come. I know, Pastor, you're being really strong here. I have to But let's, we need to just, I want to encourage you, come and let God touch you. Amen? Hallelujah. Father, you see everyone in this room. You know everything that we're dealing with. But Father, we ask you together for filling of your Holy Spirit. Baptize us in your Spirit, Lord. Father God, use us in a mighty way. As we pray in our prayer language, God, we, you, you were told that we, we, we um, uh, encourage ourselves in the faith. And Father, sometimes we just need encouragement. Holy Spirit, thank you for encouraging us this morning. Hallelujah. You, you that are, are filled with the Spirit of God, go ahead and just pray in your, your heavenly language and just worship God in your language. Hallelujah. We just thank you, Father God. Those that, if you have a prophecy that you feel God wants to speak to the church, then come up here and I'm going to give you the microphone and I'll let you share what the Holy Spirit is telling you. Because that's what the Word says, that we should all desire to prophesy. Not just some of us, everyone can prophesy because the Spirit of God, if you ask Jesus into your heart, is in each one of you. Hallelujah. And it's not something to fear because the Spirit of God 
gives us actually a fear for the Lord, the, the righteous fear of God that we should have. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here yes. again. Yes. Father, we don't want to be discouraged by our circumstances. We don't want to be discouraged by our work. We don't want to be discouraged by what we see in the natural. But Father, we want to have faith to carry on the work that you call us to do. And we know you would do that through your Holy Spirit. You encourage us individually, Holy Spirit. Thank you for that. And you encourage us corporately as we work together to be a light in this city. Yes, Father. Father God, sometimes we can't even see past the, past these four walls. God, we just have needs of our own. And Lord, by your Spirit, you will help us to get our focus on the will of God. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just go ahead and pray out loud.